BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Well, I know we have a few daily listeners to this program, so there wasn't an episode yesterday. I was just um way too under the weather. You know, it was Saturday weekend, supposed to be like, you know, free and everything, but it was pretty bad. I was just kind of laid up in bed, could uh, barely, <laughs> barely get out. So one of the things that I did was I got back to the Opperman Report and I was listening to some of his podcasts on the Zodiac Killer. Once again, that's coming from Ed Opperman and the people he's interviewing. We did um, two of them recently, kind of like some discussions about what they were saying. And I heard one with an individual named Mark Hewitt who wrote a book about the Zodiac Killer called Hunted. I believe he has three books out specifically on the Zodiac Killer alone. And the first thing that I would say, though, as um, just something that I've been noticing as a trend that is happening with kind of the deep dive Zodiac Killer researchers, and that they say two things that are almost um, identical, no matter who it is, and that is that Robert Graysmith is a fraud, that's the first one, and the second thing that they say is that Arthur Lee Allen is most likely not the Zodiac Killer. However, if they had, you know, the uh, big piece of evidence that would kind of convict them, then that they would accept that. Maybe that's three things instead of two, but when I listen to just, you know, people who have been spent years going through the Zodiac stuff, that's really what they seem to say. And Robert Graysmith, of course, wrote Zodiac and Zodiac Unmasked, and he's the subject of the 2007 David Fincher, Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr. film. And it's really about his kind of journey through the Zodiac mystery. But one of the people that was even promoting that was Michael Butterfield, who was on the Opperman Report, and he was actually a consultant for the 2007 David Fincher film, Zodiac. And I was quite surprised, though, that he was also, during the interview, he's saying, though, that he doesn't believe Robert Graysmith's stuff, he doesn't believe that Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac killer. But anyway, I was listening to the interview with Mark Hewitt, and... He is someone who does not entertain the um, group murder theory. We've been covering the Zodiac Killer on this channel since 2017, doing uploads from time to time about it. And what I would say is that um, I really began to go down the road that you're dealing with multiple people, that this, you just have the psychology of multiple people that are involved with the Zodiac murders. Mark Hewitt says something quite to the contrary. And he uses um, a kind of age-old conspiracy tactic where he's saying that if you have seven people involved, eight people, twelve people involved, the secret's going to come out. He says that it's impossible that for any large group of people to kind of hold down a secret. Someone's going to be a whistleblower. Somebody is going to kind of reveal this to the world. And um, I even heard um, somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson say this when he was being interviewed by Joe Rogan. I don't often quote Joe Rogan, but I think that Joe Rogan had a very interesting response to that when he said, he's like, multiple people can keep a secret. It's not impossible. It is the very nature of classified and top secret information. I mean, our government does it all the time. I mean, think about all the things that they do that we don't know about. Um, so like, it is possible. That would be the first thing that it kind of really, it always strikes me, though, when I hear people say that 12 people couldn't be involved in a secret operation and they wouldn't be able to let the cat out of the bag and that someone would have to blow the whistle. I mean, that's all I can really say about that. Because one of the things that we had talked about from the Opperman Report was Thomas Henry Horan, who did the um, kind of the Zodiac Killer hoax theory where he said that this was something that had been concocted by the San Francisco Police Department's Narcotics Division, and they were working in conjunction with the reporters and investigators of the San Francisco Chronicle. And this was um, kind of, I guess you'd say, organized by an individual named Hal Snook, meaning that like there was some sort of kind of, of deaths that happened during the course of the actions of the Narcotics Department, and an individual named Hal Snook created the Zodiac Killer. He wrote the letters, and, the, and um, he actually, show, he and Robert Graysmith composed the ciphers, and the Hal Snook, uh, Robert, the Hal Snook, um, Thomas Henry Horan theory is all about how Robert Graysmith is involved with this. He was um, a participant in it from the start, not committing the murders, but in the composition of the ciphers, and one of the things that um, Thomas Henry Horan promoted is that the murder of Paul Stein took place like, you know, Paul Stein was murdered in the taxi cab, and Robert Graysmith actually went into kind of like the, um, I, not exactly the morgue, but where the body was like being preserved, and he cut off the piece of, uh, 
Paul Stein's shirt way post-mortem, like, not, like, right after the murder, but Mark Hewitt was saying that just, you know, that is absolutely not true. We're dealing with the psychology of one person. And the deep dive researchers that I've been listening to who really promote the single killer theory, once again, that is not like you're not dealing with the psychology of multiple people. They say this is one person. The guys who are promoting that say something very simple, and they're just like, the Zodiac was not a sexually motivated killer, therefore he wouldn't have to kind of, you know, consistently kill at any pattern. And um, Mark Hewitt actually brought up an interesting possibility for a pattern. It's, it seems like he believes that uh, the Sherry Jo Bates murder in Riverside is genuine Zodiac activity. I have some reservations about that because Sherry Jo Bates was a very brutal killing. Um, you know, it was almost like, it was a very vicious attack, and, you know, and she's pulling out the per perpetrator's hair, or she ripped off his watch, and, I mean, like, there was a very, very big struggle, and you just don't see that with the other Zodiac killings, even Paul Stein, or even Cecilia Ann Shepard and Brian Hartnell, you just don't see that type of viciousness in the other acts of Zodiac activity, even like when I said Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, where the Zodiac is stabbing them with a knife, it's just, it doesn't have the same sort of viciousness. It was very calculated and methodical. He tied them up, and then, like, you know, he stabbed them. It was definitely something that, you could call it sadistic. I disagreed with people like Sharon Hagen, who said that it was not a sadistic murder. I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty sadistic, You're tying people up and you're stabbing them to death. Um, that sounds sadistic. Of course, Brian Hartnell survived, but Cecilia Ann Shepard passed away from her injuries in that one. It sounds sadistic, but I don't necessarily think that it is um, something that is super vicious compared to the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. But the pattern that Mark Hewitt identified is that the Zodiac activity starts very wide. So you have Sherry Jo Bates in 1966, and then that goes up to 1968. Not We don't have like any genuine activity until Lake Harmon Road of 68. Then seven months go by, uh, six or seven months until the um, Blue Rock Springs incident on July 4th. Then that sh is shortened down to um, two months, and then that's shortened down to two weeks. Like, Lake Berryessa happened two months after Blue Rock Springs, and two weeks later, um, in October of, of, of 1969, you have the murder of Paul Stein. So Mark Hewitt's sort of I mean, I think it's more of a hypothesis rather than a theory or just a possibility. He's like, at first the Zodiac started very kind of, had very large time gaps, and then he had very short time gaps, and then it just stopped completely. And, like, the reason why he's kind of promoting it from that angle is just sort of like, that's the only real pattern that we have with Zodiac activity. Some people think that the dates have some sort of astrological meaning, um, I, I was really trying to do some of that recently. I thought maybe it's related to some of the star signs under which the um, Zodiac operated. And um, one of the things, though, that he said that I haven't read um, Gray Smith's book exactly, but what I would say that apparently in Gray Smith's book, Zodiac, he says that all of the Zodiac killings happened on certain astronomical events. There are certain kind of things going on in the sky. But um, what Mark Hewitt says is that those, whatever Graysmith was talking about, they happen super frequently, even up to the point of multiple times a week. So there's really like, there really is no way you can kind of attribute it to star signs or constellations or anything of that nature. Now, um, we've been kind of just wondering, why did the Zodiac choose the name Zodiac? Um, all I can say is, if you do look at the Zodiac watches that Arthur Lee Allen did wear, it does look like a similar symbol. They have like a symbol in the middle. It's not exactly the zodiac sign, and um, but it does look somewhat similar. And in the Louis Myers theory, they're saying that that circle with the cross going through it, the symbol of the zodiac, they're saying that that is not, um, it's not the scope of a gun or anything. It's not the sight of a gun, rather. It's um, a Celtic cross because Louis Myers was very passionate about his uh, Celtic heritage. That was one thing that I had thought about for a long time. My first instinct when I saw the Zodiac symbol was, is that a, is that the sight of a gun or is that like, you know, a cross? Because uh, one of the first churches that I ever kind of like went to as a kid or something, the one that was really, you know, nearby, near my home, like they had, you know, a cross that had the circle and the cross going through it, like just it's on the top of the church. So I've always kind of thought of it that way. But when we want to look at the possibility of this being one person, um, 
it seems to me that people have provided some sort of plausible explanations, but at the same time, I don't think they have a good explanation about why things are so disconnected. I mean, I think it's an interesting observation from Mark Hewitt that, you know, the Zodiac would have started with the activities happening very in very wide distances apart, very wide timeline apart, and then it slowly gets closer and closer together, and then it just ceases to exist. I was trying some weird things, though, about trying to, um, trying to assign meaning to the dates, like, I added up all the numbers, you know, 1220 for, uh, Lake Herman Road, which, of course, happened December 20th, 1968, then Blue Rock Springs, um, July 4th, so 7-4, and I added them all up together, and then you divide them by four for the four incidents of Zodiac activity, and maybe this will reveal something about the person's name. You get nowhere with that stuff. Um, it really seems like, um, they, they could have been chosen at random. The big thing, though, that people are trying to push is that if there is one killer involved, it's like this was kind of done in sort of a way of arrogance. It was done in sort of um, a way of um, trying to kind of just be some sort of um, kind of egotistical maniac. Lyndon Lafferty even promotes that in his theory, like um, in his book, um, The Silenced Page, also known as The Zodiac Killer Cover-Up, where he's just sort of saying that the reason why he believed the Zodiac Killer operated the way he did was to restore his ego, trying to become just a very dominant force. And, like, it was all about domination as opposed to, um, as opposed to kind of sexuality. One of the things, though, that I think Mark Hewitt brought up that was very, very interesting was he says just kind of a general thing about true crime is that serial killers often function within their sexual orientation. And you see this, though, with serial killers like the Doodler or the Candyman. They, um, they are homosexuals, so they targeted men. Like, whereas, um, there is a report out there online, you know, just someone is kind of sharing some information about Richard Gajkowski, saying that Gajkowski was gay. I've never found anything to support that, but I also never found anything that said that Richard Gajkowski was married. So, I mean, I didn't really... I mean, I guess I wasn't really looking for that too closely when I first found out about Gajkowski. Was he married or single his whole life or something? But um, if Richard Gajkowski was gay, I would definitely rule him out as the Zodiac Killer because I think we're dealing with a heterosexual male. Unless you're going to entertain that Thomas Hoare and Hal Snook theory, as we said, that um, this is kind of a cover-up by the narcotics division. I would say, though, that it's not impossible it is not impossible alone. Like, the Hal Snook, Thomas Horan theory, yeah, you're going to deal with probably at least 15 people would have to be involved with that, including Paul Avery, Robert Graysmith, you know, names that are very well known to the, um, to the Zodiac lore, um, to the, to the legend of the Zodiac killer, rather. But at the same time, I don't think it's impossible. I mean, why would people want that to come out and just kind of implicate themselves in even worse things, and it also would, would mean that they are completely f fraudulent, and like Robert Graysmith's books would be meaningless if he, it turns out that he was involved with fabricating evidence from the beginning, and Thomas Horan expands on this saying that um, he believes that Robert Graysmith and um, Hal Snook were friends as kids, that they knew each other their whole lives, and they concocted this thing together, mostly through Hal Snook. He was kind of like the leading orchestrator in this, and then Gray Smith was the subservient one. I mean, from the beginning, though, when I began to sort of entertain the possibility of multiple people committing the Zodiac murders, I looked at it in a way that, why not one person committing the murders, and then you would have had someone else writing the letters and the ciphers. That wouldn't involve 15 people, that would involve two. Two. And I was like, I mean, that could definitely be something that could have, um, could have been kind of you could definitely keep that under wraps. But because, like, I mean, that would definitely be a easier way not to get caught because they wouldn't be able to trace the physical evidence back to the person who was um, committing the crimes. I would just say, though, in terms of the timeline thing that we mentioned, the alternative to kind of like these large gaps in Zodiac activity put forward by Thomas Horan was that, um, like, why are, the, why are the dates structured the way they are? Well, first of all, he eliminates Sherry Jo Bates. He says that that's not genuine Zodiac activity. I'm not convinced that it is either. Then he says um, that the reason why Paul Stein's murder happened immediately after Lake Berryessa two weeks later is because 
people started to get suspicious about Lake Berryessa. They started to get suspicious about the perpetrator who was involved with that, who was actually a park ranger um, who committed the murders of the murder of Cecilia Ann Shepard and the stabbing of Brian Hartnell. So they needed a crime to distract it to distract the public very quickly. So that's why Paul Stein was murdered. And it was possibly done by a Jordanian immigrant who had some gambling debts, who committed a series of um, taxicab robberies throughout the year. And then, um, then like, I mean, either that or it was indeed Hal Snook himself. He says that's the one possible time that Hal Snook could have committed that murder. Um, what I would say, though, is that I think that a lot of the things that we really do not have... Uh, I mean, this is going to sound kind of weird, but... If we had a survivor from Lake Herman Road, I would think that this could be a different case altogether. For example, if you look at Lake Berryessa and Blue Rock Springs, both of those things have survivors. Michael Majot survived Blue Rock Springs, and Brian Hartnell survived Lake Berryessa. And they were able to provide us with um, kind of very detailed accounts. Michael Majot was, of course, giving descriptions of what he saw in the Zodiac Killer, and then... Brian Hartnell was, of course, able to um, provide the transcript that, like, of just the conversation that he was having with the Zodiac. Now, um, when you have something of that nature, that, I mean, those are just, like, very strong primary sources. And the fact of the matter is, we don't have that from Lake Herman Road. That type of stuff just isn't there because David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen did not survive. They didn't survive the... Um, the attacks. And this is one of the things that the 1971 Zodiac film uh, talked about. Well, it's just, someone left an, an excellent comment about, like, I was kind of saying in the 1971 Zodiac film, the perpetrator at Lake Herman Road was wearing a red jacket and blue jeans, and you often think about the Zodiac, you know, wearing all black and stuff, but, you know, he's just wearing that bright red jacket and blue jeans and brown shoes and like someone left the comment that he he could have possibly painted himself neon orange. I mean, no one really has any certainty about what the Zodiac was wearing at Lake Herman Road because, well, the victims did not survive. If we had a survivor from Lake Herman Road, we would probably be able to put the pieces in order much more easily. Now, one of the things is, I told you at the beginning of this kind of segment that I was supporting the kind of group murder theory that I've really kind of looked at that for a long time, and I, I still kind of go with that. But I am open to the possibility that all of these murders were committed by one person, um, and they do seem like, you know, like they were um, kind of very well sort of arranged and connected in a sort of... Um, I mean, like, it seems like it could possibly be one person. I would just say that. I mean, you definitely seem like you have one person writing the letters and the ciphers. That, I would say, hands down. But um, one of the things that I would I kind of was very puzzled about with Ed Opperman was he talks about Edward Wayne Edwards a lot. And um, one of the reasons, I believe, is because he interviewed somebody who promoted that theory. But like when he's doing these Zodiac uploads, he's always talking about Edward Wayne Edwards. And I'm like, well, now, hey, why are you putting so much stock into that theory? I've never mentioned Ed Edwards as a possible Zodiac suspect on this channel because... I don't think that there's any merit to it. And someone was even calling him the Santa Claus of serial killers, a name that I thought was a little bit too um, too joyful or something. But then I thought, oh, they must mean that he was in many places at one time, just kind of like the way Santa Claus can be all over the world in one night. They're just blaming all of the major murders of the last 50 years on Ed Edwards. And George Hill Hodel, who we've done two uploads on this channel about, is also the same. It's like they're trying... His son, Steve Hodel, blames him for just countless murders across America and the Philippines as well. And I was just like, Ed Opperman's always asking these questions about uh, Ed Edwards, and like, do you think Ed Edwards was the Zodiac? I mean, I've never done an upload on, on him because I'm just like, no, I don't believe that. I mean, I don't believe it was Ed Edwards. I think that that stuff's just blown out of proportion. And there's another major true crime point that we have to look at. If someone is in jail... And if someone's already serving time, they can say whatever they want. And you really see this with the people who are sentenced to life in prison. They can inflate their body count. They can make up stories. They can say anything. They're already serving life in prison. And you see the people who are up for parole, like Bruce Davis or something, or somebody like him, who was up for parole. Bruce Davis was a member of the Manson family, but also became a Zodiac killer suspect. The thing about him is that 
he flat out denies that he was the Zodiac Killer. He provides reasons why not. Because he was up for parole. He doesn't want to stay in jail forever. But the people who are going to be kind of in life in prison without the possibility of parole, those are the guys who are going to be like, well, I mean, they can say whatever they want just because it's probably the only form of entertainment that they have in their... um in their prison life it's like the only thing that they can do to work toward anything is just to kind of inflate their body count or kind of be all braggadocious about something they have nothing else to look forward to and you really see this with the case of glenn rogers who was not a zodiac suspect but he's um he was the casanova killer a different serial killer and he might have possible ties to the oj simpson case and he's going to be the subject of the film the murder of nicole brown simpson which is going to come out in december of 2019 it's now October 2019 at the time of this recording. So um, that's what we had going on. I mean, now, what do we make of this timeline stuff that was put forward by Mark Hewitt about how we have kind of Sherry Jo Bates, Lake Herman Road, those things are years apart, about two years apart. Then we have Lake Herman Road to Blue Rock Springs, those seven months apart. Then Lake then the two months to Lake Berryessa and two weeks to Paul Stein. Is that specifically done? Is that actually any sort of meaning? Or is that like a psychological trait? Or did the Zodiac or possible Zodiac killers, killers plural, did they just choose a bunch of dates at random? I would say no matter what you're going to entertain, if you're going to entertain the Zodiac killer group theory or you're going to say that this was just one person, it seems like the person who did this was of above average intelligence and he could have very easily chosen the dates at random so there wouldn't be any way to figure it out leave people constantly guessing i mean that's the kind of easiest way not to get caught or not to get figured out then what you have is unless you're actually going to go down this kind of hal snook thomas horn theory that um people died as a result of the um narcotics division of the sfpd and they needed to protect their confidential informants so hal snook created the zodiac killer image as a way to distract the public and the media from the actions of the narcotics department once again protecting their cis i mean i mean i i would say though that it's a very interesting theory put forward by thomas warren but i can't confirm it a hundred percent because it is outrageous. I will tell you, it is outrageous. But, um, you know, it's like, and it's like a very far out theory, but um, it does provide explanations. But the, at the same time, though, um, like I said, I'm open to the group murder theory, but if this was indeed one person, I wouldn't be completely shocked. What do you have to say? Until next time.